Welcome to Bitcoin for Everyone, an original Coin Academy course designed to provide an introduction to the world's most popular alternative currency, Bitcoin. This course is divided into a series of lessons. There are eight lessons in this particular course. The first lesson, this lesson, is called What is Bitcoin? The second, a brief history of Bitcoin. The third, how you can use Bitcoin. The fourth, investing in Bitcoin. The fifth lesson is entitled Understanding the Risks. The sixth, before you buy your first Bitcoin. The seventh, how to obtain Bitcoin. And the final lesson, how to get your money out of Bitcoin. Now, it's good if you can go through these in order, but uh, it's not 100% necessary. If you want to skip around to different topics that are the most interest to you, feel free to do so. But let's go ahead and get started with the first lesson, which answers the most common question we hear. That is, what is Bitcoin? A short definition, Bitcoin is a digital currency. Now that's a very simplistic definition, but it captures the essence of what makes Bitcoin unique. That is, there is no physical counterpart for Bitcoin. There is no piece of paper, there is no scrap of metal that represents the currency. Instead, it's a string of numbers that resides somewhere on a computer. There's nothing for you to lock away in a bank account, put in a physical wallet, etc. It is virtual, it is digital. Specifically, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, and it was created for use as an alternative to traditional national currencies, often referred to as fiat currencies. Now, I know that term introduces a new idea, cryptocurrency, so let's define that. A cryptocurrency is a type of digital currency that uses cryptography to facilitate transactions and provide an avenue for creating new units of the currency. Both of those characteristics apply to Bitcoin and are part of what makes Bitcoin special. One of the other key attributes of Bitcoin is that there is no central bank. It is decentralized. There's no central governing body. Instead, there's a peer-to-peer -peer network of stakeholders spread out all over the world. This is extremely important because it means we don't have a central bank making national decisions in a local government's best interests. Instead, it's, it's more uh, egalitarian in that sense. The stakeholders themselves are distributed around the world. They all have interest in Bitcoin. They all have an interest in maintaining the integrity of the Bitcoin network. And uh, we're also extremely constrained by the algorithms and the mathematical formula that are used to create Bitcoin. Those can't be affected or modified by the stakeholders. So it retains quite a bit of autonomy. Transactions are processed in the Bitcoin network by computers around the world. They're all networked together and they're all running Bitcoin software. You know, in contrast, if there was a central bank or a monitor, monetary authority, they would be handling and processing the transactions. They would each have their own ledger that they would be maintaining. In the case of Bitcoin, there are ledgers distributed around the world that are synchronized, and this is how transactions are processed and updated and how we're protected from people double spending Bitcoins. Bitcoins are known as Bitcoins. <laughs> Bitcoin, the singular, refers to the entire system. In terms of the currency symbol that you'll see on Forex exchanges, you'll see it represented as XBT, uh, oftentimes in articles about Bitcoin or outside of the Forex exchanges, it's represented as BTC. You'll also see this symbol or variations of this symbol. This means Bitcoin. To put all this in a nutshell, if you just want to get your head around it quickly, it's virtual money. And the beauty of this virtual money is that you can buy things with it and you can buy it with and exchange it for physical currency. The other question we hear all the time are how are Bitcoins created? Now, this is through a process that's known as mining. This is one of the more technical topics related to Bitcoin, and we're not going to dive into the, the technical aspects of it. But the short version is Bitcoins are given out as a reward for validating transactions and updating the ledger. Now, this means that bit, that network of people running the Bitcoin software all over the world actually are rewarded for running the software for validating the transactions and updating the ledger, giving them all a stake and maintaining it, making sure that the ledger is updated properly and that transactions are validated in timely fashion. It's extremely competitive. Competitive. It also means that miners are an essential part of the ecosystem. They earn new bitcoins for their work. At least they will up to the point that uh, bitcoins cease to be produced. And that brings us to our next topic, which is the creation of bitcoins and the fact that it's strictly controlled. Unlike a national currency, a fiat currency, where the government may authorize the printing of new notes at any time and therefore diluting the value of the monetary supply, this can never happen with bitcoin. Bitcoin creation is controlled by the algorithms that relate to the underlying structure of Bitcoin. 
This means we know how many Bitcoins are in existence at any moment in time. We know when the next Bitcoins will be created. They're created about every 10 minutes. We know exactly how many will be created in total across the entire life of the Bitcoin creation process. There's a cap on the total number. And that after that cap is reached, no more will be created. Now, that cap's not going to be reached until the middle of the next century, so it isn't something that bothers us right now. But this whole idea that the supply is controlled and we have certainty on the supply uh, is one of the key attributes of Bitcoin because what it means is that Bitcoin is largely isolated from inflationary currency factors. And what I'm talking about here is the dilution of the value of the money supply due to the printing of new money. One of the questions we hear all the time is, is Bitcoin real or is it just a bubble? Uh, and we see this speculated on widely in the press. While everyone has their opinion about this, let's just look at some numbers. The numbers tend to tell us a more objective uh, opinion about things. First, how many Bitcoins are in circulation? Well, at the time this was recorded, there were 13,198,475 Bitcoins in circulation. Now, this will change by the time you've watched this because, again, they're created every 10 minutes. The current valuation of a single Bitcoin in U.S. dollars is $508.12. This means the total market cap for the Bitcoin money supply is $6.7 billion, a significant sum. Moreover, in the last 24 hours, 69,681 Bitcoins changed hands. That means our 24-hour turnover was $35.4 million, significant numbers. Change in value over the last 12 months, Bitcoin has increased in value 370%. Now hold on to your hats. Over the last 24 months, it's over just slightly 1,000%. Let's put this in perspective. The Bitcoin money supply is currently the fifth largest in the world. It's significantly larger than the sixth largest, which would be the United Kingdom, and it's just slightly smaller than the fourth largest, which is Japan. And at current growth rates, it will be the third largest money supply in the world by mid-2015. Now, when we talk about money supply here, we're talking about M1. We're not talking about uh, credit cards or other sorts of uh, debt instruments. Let's wrap up this lesson by looking at popular Bitcoin myths and hopefully skewering a few of these. We hear these all the time. We see them in the press. The first, Bitcoin is primarily used for illegal transactions. Well, Bitcoin is certainly used for illegal transactions, but so is real money. Uh, in fact, one of the attributes uh, or what that you want in a money supply is that it can be used regardless of what's being bought and sold. Uh, if you couldn't use Bitcoin for illegal transactions, it, it wouldn't be much good. Neither would the U.S. dollar, neither would the euro. But is it primarily used for illegal transactions? No, I would say not. In fact, right now it looks like it's primarily used by Forex traders and by investors. Um, I think the confusion here comes from the Silk Road situation. There was an online exchange known as Silk Road, which traded in all sorts of nefarious goods. And a lot of the transactions on Silk Road occurred in Bitcoin because of the anonymity aspect of Bitcoin. Silk Road was uh, taken down. The owners were busted. Uh, and a large number of Bitcoins were seized. And this is where the press came from on this. Uh, that Bitcoin was later auctioned off by the U.S. government for a tidy profit. But is it primarily used for illegal transactions? No, it's not. Next myth. Bitcoin went bankrupt and lots of people lost their money. Well, we know where this one comes from. This is confusion about the Mt. Gox incident. Mt. Gox was a currency exchange based in Japan. At the time, it was the largest Bitcoin exchange in the world. There was a theft at Mt. Gox and Bitcoin were lost. As a result of the theft, Mt. Gox went bankrupt, causing further loss. People get confused about this because they think somehow Mt. Gox and Bitcoin are interchangeable. They aren't. Mt. Gox is like a bank. If a bank was robbed and then subsequently went bankrupt and became insolvent, we wouldn't blame it on the U.S. dollar. You shouldn't blame the Mt. Gox situation on Bitcoin. Next, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Well, I think the real problem here is the definition of Ponzi scheme. People miss out that for something to be a Ponzi scheme, there has to be someone at the top of the pyramid who's benefiting from it. That's not possible because Bitcoin uses a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer structure. There is no one at the top. Everyone's an equal stakeholder in that sense. Final, or next, it's hard to buy and sell Bitcoin. Well, I have to admit, for somebody who's new to it, it's difficult. 
uh, but it's not impossible. And certainly once you understand the basic concepts and you have the right tools, um, it's not hard at all. In fact, it's very, very simple. It's very easy. Um, and I think it's getting easier and easier. And then the final myth, and this is one that's just cropped up recently, Bitcoin was created by the CIA. I honestly don't know where this one comes from other than just the general conspiracy theorist tendency to blame everything on the CIA. Um, if it was created by the CIA, and we don't know who the original creators of Bitcoin were, frankly, um, but, you know, we should thank them. <laughs> but uh, it makes no sense because it is a open source software system. Uh, anyone can see the code. Anyone can work with it. Anyone can download it, put it on their computer and use it. Um, it, it really doesn't serve any benefit for it to have been created by the CIA. Uh, it strikes me as nothing short of implausible. That's it for lesson one. Uh, join us for lesson two when we're going to take a look at a brief history of Bitcoin. Thank you.